So we've got Sonia Gallego, who's from the UK. She's an international broadcast journalist who has reported from around Europe on politics and society. And she's going to talk to us today on how the transgender identity issue has taken precedence recently and what the effect has been on accurate reporting as well as women's rights. So thank you so much, Sonia. And it would be really interesting to hear your specific uh, view on this because of, um, you know, you're right in a way in the thick of it with all this being a journalist. So thanks so much and over to you. So let me go back to 2015, all those years ago. There was an extremely interesting op-ed that was published in the New York Times. Writer and Oscar-winning filmmaker Elena Burkett wrote a searing essay on the new sexism that was infiltrating our societies under the aegis of transgender rights. The essay titled, What Makes a Woman? Burkitt began by focusing on how the president emeritus of Harvard, Lawrence H. Summers, who was frequently criticized by progressives for being called bullying and reactionary, was faced with a cavalcade of heavy criticism for saying that men and women have different brains. This, Summers said, would explain uh, women's inherent ineptitude for STEM subjects, for example, and the justifiable outrage even prompted donors to withhold funds in protest. Yet a decade later, this very idea of a male brain and a female brain that came with inclinations such as liking pink, playing with dolls, and finding that the hardest thing about being a woman was deciding what to wear, thank you very much, Caitlin Jenner, came to be accepted not just as a truth, but the foundation for a so-called civil rights movement. And in my view, the basis for the current medical scandal engulfing our youth embodied as the trans child. Burkett argued that when Bruce Jenner confirmed his change of identity to Caitlin Jenner, he was reiterating the same sexist values that Summers had done, such as being so much more aware of their emotions, except now there was praise for this reductive notion. We as women by virtue of our biology are forced to navigate the world with a distinct set of challenges and experiences. And Burkett laid this bare by critiquing the ideas that were paving the way for this revisionist take on women. She warned them, as many do now, that dubbing the reality of our bodies as exclusionary was dangerous and as sexist to women as the idea that ladies can't science. There were letters of praise to the New York Times for daring to publish this piece that so eloquently voiced women's concerns. But as you can imagine, booming louder in volume, but not necessarily in truth, were the howls of anger that followed. It predictably was condemned as an attack on trans identifying men without acknowledgement of the fact that at the heart of this essay was the notion that women do not want to be seen as a set of sex stereotypes, but as whole human beings, and that the appropriation of these stereotypes by wealthy men is regressive and hypocritical when women have fought against this their entire lives. Later that year, Caitlyn Jenner was presented with the Glamour magazine's Women of the Year Award. A fitting progression, in my view, for the women's magazine sector that has profited from women's discomfort with their own bodies. Although I didn't realise it at the time, this essay piqued me. Externally, I was still very much of the opinion, superficially, that trans women were women because, come on, didn't they have it so much harder? Wasn't their plight more dangerous? So we were being told. Bearing in mind that in my experience, in life and in my career as a journalist, I knew full well that the lot of women was not comfortable in the least. I filed this away though, deciding not to pay any attention to it because of the obvious cognitive dissonance. But it would bubble up. I remember during an assignment in Tunisia, I visited a home for women who were victims of human trafficking in Libya. The stories of how women were repeatedly raped prostituted, even while pregnant, heavily pregnant, made me realize that there was no avoiding the fundamental truths at the heart of women's oppression. During this time as well, a war was raging in Iraq and Syria, where women were being killed 
brutalized and sex trafficked in the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Nothing could be more jarring than the truth of what was happening to women around the world on the basis of their sex. Yet this was apparently going unnoticed by predominantly liberal legacy media outlets in the West. As horrific stories abounded, such as that of the Nobel Peace Prize winner Nadia Murad's terrifying ordeal at the hands of Daesh, women in the West were being called out and hounded for simply referring to the lived reality of their sex bodies. The Women's March at the start of the Trump's, uh, Trump pres presidency was a case in point. The so-called pussy hats came under severe criticism because they were trans exclusionary. The fight to draw attention to the very basis of women's oppression, i.e. her ability to reproduce, was facing an existential threat by a president who sought women in a derogatory fashion and was being torn apart also by trans identifying men who believed they too had ownership of the female experience. Liberal organizations such as the Women's March capital, capitulated without a single fight. They apologized, they promised to do better and became incorporated into this new male rights movement. In an interview with Grazia magazine, Trans activist Monroe Bergdorf stated that women are getting feminism wrong by focusing on the source of our oppression, our sex bodies. Bergdorf's argument was that women are more than vaginas. Thanks for the reminder, Monroe. And we had to be inclusive of males in order to be accepted in the new liberal world order. Yet not a peep was heard from supposedly progressive women's magazines. It was accepted as a truth without any consideration of how this would come to affect women's rights. In fact, they are, and they continue to be fundamental in pushing and promoting this idea, this tactic of keeping women disassociated from themselves in favor of keeping cosmetic companies or fashion houses ticking along a profit. In 2018, as the Taliban were advancing in Afghanistan and carrying out a series of attacks in the capital Kabul, President Trump nominated anti-abortionist Brett Kavanaugh as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. And the march to make trans rights the civil cause, the civil rights cause was well underway. Gender was now replacing sex and women were becoming social constructs. But there was no joined up thinking in how this would affect us or how it would impact our rights. In the UK, this was being stoked into a culture war with Stonewall by now practically only campaigning on trans rights at the helm. In 2016, the then chair of the Women and Equalities Parliamentary Committee, Maria Miller, produced a report to introduce self-ID into the UK, replacing the previous gender recognition process. It had cross-party support, and during a time when the country was entering a politically toxic time post the Brexit referendum, it was being seen as a small advancement of progress in a country that was beginning to lose its collective sanity amid the debate over leaving the European Union. But something else was going on. Away from the rage of the Brexit debate, there began a surge in referrals to the Tavistock Gender Identity Development Service, known as JIDS, in particular among girls. It was an astonishing escalation. In the ashes of the Me Too and Believe Her movements, something was happening that was disproportionately affecting girls and young women, yet the media attention was focusing on male trans figures such as Bergdorf, Laverne Cox, Caitlyn Jenner, etc., etc. It was in 2019 when Deborah Cohen and Hannah Barnes really came out with reports of what was going on at JIDS and the program of dispensing puberty blockers to children self-identifying as the opposite sex for BBC's Newsnight. It was a revelation and they bravely stood out among the affirmation culture that was being dispensed elsewhere under the guise of inclusivity, and the LGBTQIA plus model that was being pushed by Stonewall et al. Barnes and Cohen bravely ripped off the cover of what was the latest promulgate, promulgation of trans rights. And that was the transitioning of children 
and the effect of what that would have on their health and development. But the trans co-opted media, such as Pink News, did not like this at all and railed against their coverage. Now let's fast forward to today. And Hannah Barnes has just published her long awaited book on JIDS. And even then, despite the enormity of this medical scandal, she's faced numerous difficulties in publishing it. But boy, are we glad that she managed to and has now paved the way for an honest discussion on so-called trans children and how transitioning them has implications for their health. Also throughout this time, an extraordinary experiment was well on the way in Scotland. The Scottish Prison Service introduced its gender identity and gender reassignment policy where male prisoners would now be held according to which st sex stereotype they identified with. It was developed with the Scottish Trans Alliance as well as Stonewall, and despite the alarms that were raised by some Scottish members of parliament, it was implemented. In 2019, when a Scottish TV news report raised concerns about how female inmates were being subject to sexualized behavior by trans identifying male inmates, the SPS disregarded them by saying it had committed to holding an open consultation to the policy and that it had been in operation successfully for the past numbers of years since 2014. Now, let's fast forward to this year and the hubris of the Scottish prison service has come crashing down, as is that of the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on this issue. Many had not anticipated how this would come to affect societies, as concerns on the issue had been consigned to the sidelines of the press with few outlets giving it the proper attention it deserved. I personally was dismayed at the attitude of certain editors and journalists who continue to see this as a niche issue without realizing the effect it would have on the safety of women and girls and taking the words of the Scottish government for granted. There was much confusion as to what it would entail, precisely because eminent journalists who had waxed lyrical about issues such as the Northern Highland Protocol hadn't bothered to research what this profound change to female protections would involve and they got the details wrong. Reporters spoke of legal, legal gender, not understanding that it was legal sex that could be changed in just three months without a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and a promise to stick to their new legal sex in exchange for a five pound certificate that decreed it thus. The deliberate obfuscation of such vitally important information was then laid bare for all to see when the case of Adam Graham, otherwise known as Isla Bryson, came to light. Graham, a double rapist who assumed a trans identity after being arrested, was the eye opener that forced reporters to acknowledge what had been going on. The continual fudging around his pronouns, especially that of the first minister proved too much for many and support for her took a hit, especially in a nation like Scotland, which if you'll forgive the stereotype has a decidedly no nonsense approach. The women didn't wish. A lot of the men didn't either. And it came to a shock that such a small niche issue was in part responsible for bringing down the leadership of a woman who had withstood several challenges during her time in office. Humbled by those she previously dismissed as homophobes, misogynists and racists for not supporting the gender recognition reform bill, Sturgeon, a self-identifying feminist at her fingertips is now estranged from the very people she promised to lead towards independence. A warning, in my opinion, for any politician that seeks to go down the road of enforcing the liberalization of legal fallacies and the outlets that promote them. Where just a few years ago, this was still new, the supposedly liberal civil rights movement that came fast off the Me Too movement, leaving it for dust in its wake and cannibalize the Black Lives Matter movement as a way for middle-class men to assume their position in the pyramid of oppression. When rapists were deemed by a government to be the underdog in this fight between protecting women's single sex spaces and a man's self-declared identity based on sex stereotypes, it jarred. It was not popular. And the mere fact of such issues being censored or tarred as too toxic or niche to give it its due consideration, the impact will be felt when legislation crashes into reality. Now back to the New York Times. These few months have seen, in my view, a vindication 
of Eleanor Burkitt's essay. The paper finally published an important article on the health concerns of subjecting children to puberty blockers in November last year. Needless to say that given what we know now, thanks to the Cass interim report and the sterling work of Hannah Barnes in her book, Time to Think, among many others, these concerns were absolutely justified in my view. Pamela Paul followed it up a month later with an op-ed entitled Free to be you and me or not, which extolled the virtues of liberating children from sex stereotypes rather than deploying them as a diagnostic tool of an ethereal, unfounded, quasi-religious system to which we all must adhere. The reaction was predictably followed by cries of transphobia, when in reality it was just a plea for children to be liberated from the constraints of gendered identities. And we are perhaps beginning to see a backbone developing in the old grey lady. They dared to publish Paul's op-ed in defence of J.K. Rowling's uh, off the back of Megan Phelps Roper's just released podcast, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. And she highlights the absurdity of the campaign against the writer and correctly calls it out as dangerous, defamatory character assassination, especially in light of the attempt on Salman Rushdie's life last year. Not once have any of Rowling's detractors mentioned what she said, that she has never disputed gender dysphoria, nor how she has opposed, nor has she ever opposed allowing people to transition, and she has never denied trans identifying people their right to exist or indeed any of their human rights. The howls of protests from its millennial activist employees and assorted trans rights groups, even from The Onion, a satirical outlet have forced the New York Times to push back by stating, and I quote, our journalism strives to explore, interrogate, and reflect on the experiences, ideas, and debates in society. To help readers understand them, our reporting did exactly that, and we're proud of it. This is a welcome turn of events. And as more and more evidence emerges of the harms that gender identity ideology does, as reflected in what was happening at the Tavistock JIDS, where 97.5% of children undergoing treatment were either on the autism spectrum or had other mental health issues, and that 80% of them had discovered they were same-sex attracted, we are staring dead in the eye of an egregious medical scandal. And we as journalists have a right and a duty to examine this without the loud influence of lobbies that profit from the fable of the trans child. Do you think things are changing? Do you think more journalists are now understanding what's going on or are they willing to speak out on this or is, is there still a lot of resistance? I think there is still uh, a certain resistance and I think we see that consistently in the articles which show trans identifying men being described as she and her still. I'm slightly more hopeful now that Ipso are, uh, have called for um, uh, people to give their opinions about how the reporting around these issues should proceed. We've understandably seen the um, the limits of of accurate of how that what that places on accuracy and certainly our jobs as reporters as well to to report things as accurately as possible but I think the work of for example Hannah Barnes is absolutely crucial I think the op-eds um are also another crucial um point as well but also interestingly enough um I've noticed that also social media not just Twitter but also TikTok is now becoming more open to having gender critical voices. They're not censoring them as much. And that's only happened in the last couple of months. Um, I thought that was a very curious turn of events. And I do think that enough momentum is building up so that people can actually dictate exactly how, what the facts are on these situations, because it just got to the point where facts were being censored and I think that's where we run into deeply, deeply dangerous territory, um, especially when it comes to reporting on medical scandals.